All right, welcome back to another episode of Creedal Catholic. I am sitting here virtually, of course, with Dr. Larry Chapp, my good friend, who is joining me yes. once again, I think for the third time on this podcast. Yeah. And as I mentioned last week, I'm excited to uh, to announce a continuing collaboration with Larry. So Larry's going to be coming on the show once every month or so. We're going to try to do this regularly. Uh, Larry, welcome back. I'm, I'm pleased to have you. And I have to say that you, you've been a popular guest on the show. I've heard from people <laughs> who say, hey, you got to get that, that Dr. Chap guy back on. He's really good. So welcome back. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I mean, my former students always said I, I clearly have kissed the Blarney Stone. I, I, you know, I can talk some stuff. I don't know if Perfect. I make any sense, but I can talk. Uh, well, I mean, so far, I think you've made sense. So you're heading yeah. in the right direction. Uh, we'll see if we can keep it up for today. <laughs> Um, no, I'm, I'm super glad to have you back. I, I love the way that you think about the church, uh, and you and I have had really good discussions in the past, yeah. and, and I think yeah. it's pretty evident that we think think about things in the same ways. Uh, I think you know, so far we come to mostly the same conclusions, so it's always a pleasure to, to have you on and just pick your brain on things. Great. Um, I will, I will redirect my—I'm sorry? I'm glad to be on. Yeah, absolutely. I'll redirect my listeners slash viewers to your blog, gaudium at spes22.com, G A U D I U M. E-T-S-P-E-S-2-2.com. Uh, and Larry, I don't think I've asked you. I mean, um, Gaudium et Spes, obviously, the, uh, the, is an abstract letter in the encyclical of Paul VI. Uh, but what's the 2-2 what's the two two about? Is it paragraph 22 or section 22 of that yeah, document? Where did it's, that come from? It's, it's, uh, it's the document from Vatican II, the Church in the Modern World, Gaudium et Spes. And yeah, it's section 22 of that. And that's how these Vatican II documents are, are specified by, by numerical section. And it really was the central uh, central section of Vatican II quoted by John Paul II all the time. In almost every encyclical that JP II wrote, he quotes Gaudium et Spes, section 22, the opening sentence, it is only in the light of the incarnate word that the mystery of man makes sense. And so in other words, John Paul takes Gaudium et Spes 22 as the hermeneutical key, the interpretive key for the entire council, which he saw as a Christocentric refocusing of all of theology through the lens of Christ. Yeah, well, I, I thought it might have been the case that that was what the 2-2 two, two referred to. So I was actually reading up on Gaudium et Spes a couple days ago, and I thought, this has to be section 22, and so yes. I was giving giving that a read, and yeah, I mean, only through the light of the incarnate word. Um, and it's, it's so true. And, and you and I were emailing a little bit about this and we're going to talk about, um, the church's Constantinian arrangement today. Yes. But I wonder, you know, Vatican II, we've, we've talked about this before as well, especially from the rad trads these days, Vatican II has come under attack, uh, extensively. And there are issues as we've discussed before with, you know, whether or not you apply a hermeneutic of rupture or a hermeneutic of continuity, et cetera. We obviously fall into the hermeneutic of continuity camp because there yes. is no other place for a an Orthodox Catholic to fall. Valid um, cancel. What are you going to do with it? Right, exactly. Um, but, you know, it's really interesting because one of the things that was emphasized for the lay faithful at Vatican II was this universal call to holiness. Yes. And this is something that St. Josemaria Escriva um, was helping the church to, to recognize and understand throughout his work in the early 20th century. And I wonder, you know, one, one of the things that you've written about very recently that we'll talk about is this Constantinian arrangement and sort of the way out of it. And the way out of it has to be holiness. And we've talked about this before, right? But we, we end up sort of yeah. doing this hand wringing all the time. Like, how will we, you know, just before we hit record, we were talking about the uh, the recent uh, appointment of Bishop Tobin to the um, to the bishops' committee for the Vatican. And uh, you know, there's there are a lot of problems across the church, and we often end up doing all this hand wringing and wondering what's the way out of it. And we're not focusing on what we need to be focusing, which is holiness. Um, right. So. So I, I appreciate that about the Second Vatican Council, and I think that aspect is is underappreciated, quite frankly, because there is uh, there is this dire need in the Church for men and women of faith to to focus on their personal holiness, their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Oh, I agree. To me, that it will be the lasting legacy of Vatican II beyond the Christocentrism and the return to the fathers and the sources. It is the universal call to holiness, because what the Council Fathers understood was that the challenge that the modern world presents to us can only be met by an educated and faithful laity that is energized to be that leaven in the world. Priests and bishops cannot really be a leaven in the world. Lay people mm -hmm. have to be in the world. Unfortunately, what happened after the Council is that lay people simply seem to absorb the world rather than to bring the gospel in. But that's a whole conversation perhaps for, for a different day. But, sure, but I mean, but it certainly applies to what we want to talk about today, which yeah, is this, this church's constant arrangement. And we've talked about this before as well, right? That, 
you know, the, the, the Second Vatican Council called the church to be um, a, a reader of the signs of the times so that yeah. it can more effectively engage with the times. And I think what, what ended up happening in many instances, perhaps even most instances, is after that people were like, yeah, I read the signs of the times and let's go along with the signs of the times. Well, and exactly. So, when you, so many liberal theologians after the council spoke all the time about we need to read the signs of the times, we need to read the signs yeah. of the times. But what they th meant by that was we need to figure out what it is that the modern world wants and we need right. to conform ourselves to it, right. to, to change the gospel to be palatable to that rather than the way yeah. around. That's why I often tell my, my traditionalist critics, Vatican II was not too radical. Vatican II was not radical enough mm -hmm. <laughs> because it did not really call out modern culture in the way that, you know, we were talking earlier about Gaudium et Spes. Gaudium et Spes 22, to me, is the best part of Gaudium et Spes. Mm -hmm. The rest of the document, in my opinion, is overly optimistic towards the modern world and a, and a little bit naive about the toxic nature of the modern world. I wish Vatican II and Gaudium et Spes had been a little more, a little more savvy in their understanding yeah of just what it is that we're up against here in, in the modern world and modern culture. Now, I know Vatican II was trying to be irenic, mm -hmm. to lower the fortress mentality, engage in dialogue, and it's hard to do that while you're condemning. So, you know, I, I, I'll give them credit for that. But there was a naivete there. Yeah, totally. Well, let's talk about the topic of today, which is this Constantinian arrangement. Right. Uh, you wrote this this fantastic piece on your blog, yadimitsbest22.com, uh, in which you explored this, and, and your complaint is really that the church has emphasized worldly power too much. It has grown too comfortable with its relationship with worldly powers. Uh, it has often viewed itself as a worldly power. It has measured its own success in terms of worldly success and power. Yeah. Um, and and you, you start out with this quote from Benedict XVI, one of our favorites, um, that goes like this. The appearance of the church in the modern era shows that in a completely new way it has become a church of heathens, and increasingly so— no longer as it once was, a church made up of heathens who have become Christians, but a church of heathens who will call themselves Christians, but have really become heathens. Heathenism is entrenched today in the church itself. That is the mark of the church of our time and also of the new heathenism. This heathenism is actually in the church and a church in whose heart heathenism lives. And if that sounds like it's something from Benedict XVI writing in 2010, uh, you'd be grossly mistaken. That is the then, then priest Joseph Ratzinger, writing in October 1958. So so before the yeah. days of the Second Vatican Council, this is something that he recognized. Uh, so so let's sort of, sort of dispel with the with the myth of the pre-Vatican II fantasy land. <laughs> I mean, even then, yeah. Joseph Ratzinger, Reverend Joseph Ratzinger, was recognizing that this is already becoming a church of heathens, so much so that he says it's, it's a mark of the church right now. Yeah, exactly. And that was a bombshell article that came out in 1958. It was one of his very, very first publications as a freshly minted uh, theologian. And people didn't understand, he almost failed his doctoral exam because uh, wow. because he had he had theological enemies, particularly one, Michael Schmaus. But I, it's, I, I, there's a great biography out now on Benedict called from Peter Sewall, which is where I got that quote on, on heathenism. Uh, so the reason why I'm emphasizing that he had difficulty getting his doctoral dissertation passed is to show what courage he actually had to then immediately after narrowly escaping academic death, to come out in 1958 and publish this extremely incendiary article that really put him on the map as a marked man to all the arch traditionalists of the church. And because he's calling them heathens. <laughs> he's calling them heathens, he's calling them pagans, and it really does give the lie to the idea that the pre-Vatican II church was this monolithic, healthy, vibrant, faith-filled thing when in point of fact it wasn't. I mean, something has to account for why the bottom fell out of the church almost overnight. As right. soon as the council lifted the lid on the ecclesiastical libido, everybody went nuts. So that tells me that they weren't formed. Pro the people that went nuts were not formed by the council. They were formed before the council. Yep. All right. The, a, a, a catalyst is a kind of a cause. But a catalyst needs an underlying agent to catalyze. It needs tinder, right? It needs tinder. Okay, yeah. and so, yeah, Vatican II was a catalyst, but there had to be something there to set ablaze, you know, and, and there was, and there were terrible problems in the preconciliar church. So that's that's why I used uh, Ratzinger there to underscore the fact, okay, so there were problems in the preconciliar church. 
what is the source of those problems? Well, the source is obviously multifocal. I don't want to say, okay, there's, I know the exact answer to that. But I think clearly one of the main reasons is that the faith had become kind of external, forensic, legalistic, rule-based. And this is precisely what happens uh, as going all the way back to Kierkegaard when you have state churches. State churches become safe churches, right. become status quo churches, become hollow churches, and uh, because they're busy protecting mammon, they're busy protecting structure and bureaucracy and employment and status quo morality and family structure and all these sorts of things, they're not going to rock any boat. And, I mean, look at the example of modern-day Ireland and modern-day Poland. Two nations that had state churches, essentially, but not under communism, obviously. But, right, right. but you know what I mean, that, that, that Catholicism was Poland, Poland was Catholicism. And same in mm -hmm. Ireland, I, that Catholicism was state. Those two countries are now seeing a rapid decline in their Catholic faith. Especially Ireland, yeah. Especially, especially Ireland, but yeah. from what I read, <laughs> Poland is fast becoming the Ireland of Eastern yeah. Europe. Soon to be a, a, a formerly Catholic country. And, but my point is, that's because the, the faith was not deeply evangelical. Uh, it, it was more rooted, in, it was more rooted in, in a kind of coming together of culture and politics and church in this big witch's brew of a mess. And uh, so anyway, that, well, that, and this is, th this is exactly the Constantinian arrangement that yes, you're talking about yes. in this article. And, and so you, you say, let me quote a little bit here, the deeper problem brought out clearly by Bernanos, because you talk about a, a novel by the novelist George Bernanos, yeah. is the church's 1700 year commitment to various iterations of the Constantinian arrangement. Now that refers to um, Con Emperor Constantine, right? Who, who made yeah. essentially the church coterminous with his state power and state rule. With his empire. Exactly. And, and so, you know, the empire ended where the church ended and vice versa. And that's obviously a huge problem. Um, but that really laid the foundation for the existence of the church over the next centuries, almost, you know, millennia plural. Um, and we still find some of that today. And so, as you say in this article, that makes the church into this sort of juridical, uh, juridical meaning, you know, having to do with, with laws and more specifically sort of earthly laws, yeah. this juridical yeah. body. Um, it, it means that the church ends up being bound up intimately with the, the powers of the state, whatever that state is. Uh, you have cardinals getting cozy with kings and vice versa. Oh, yeah. um, and, and, and because of that, the church loses evangelical impulse. I mean, Jesus tells us you cannot serve both God and mammon. So, of course, a church that is trying to serve mammon, of course, a church that is trying to uh, gain power for itself in worldly terms is going to suffer uh, its evangelical zeal because of it. Now you say in the, in your article that this is this is rather a cliche, right? It's it's not a particularly unique insight to say the Constantinian arrangement is bad, right? But I think you get at some things here that perhaps are new or at least not so cliche. So what do you think would be unique about your thesis here, as you know, compared to someone who just says uh, the church isn't after worldly power; we just need to follow Jesus? Because I think I can think of a lot of Protestants, for example, who say that who point to the Catholic Church and say they're just interested in power and glory, and they don't care about a relationship with Jesus. I mean, so that insight isn't, isn't that interesting to me, but I think some of what you get at here is, is a lot different than that, um, certainly more nuanced than that. So what would you, what would you say sort well, of I, I, characterizes yours? The first thing that you want to point out is that you're talking here not in black and white categories. You're talking here in a question of emphasis. Sure. Obviously, the church has to have rules and laws and juridical structure and, yeah. and has to cooperate on some level. Uh, with, with the powers that be. So you're, you're talking about here an emphasis. And what differentiates my, uh, my approach to this for, from some others is that I'm not merely criticizing what you might call a hard integralism. Integralism means essentially where the spiritual power, the spiritual power is conceived of as superior to the civil power and has authority over the civil power. And thus you have this direct union of throne and altar where in, in essence the Pope can dictate to the princes and the aristocracy and the kings and the emperors, here's what you're going to do, even in the civil sphere. Right. And can, can select their successors, oh, etc. Oh, yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, crown them and all that. Right. So right. that's a hard integralism, and obviously almost everybody critiques that now uh, because it doesn't, it doesn't respect the legitimate 
independence of the civil sphere. Well, the church yourself later came to see this, and so you came up with this two-sword idea that there's two right. authorities. There's the civil authority, and then there's the spiritual authority. And in theory, the spiritual authority is superior to the civil authority, but in practice, they pretty much sort of let each other deal with their own areas of competency. So that's a more of a, of a soft integralism, and, and a lot of people have no big issue with that. I mean, because this is the kind of integralism you saw in Ireland or you saw yeah. in, in, a, in, in, you know, in, in France and Spain and some of these other, in Italy for, for a while. You know, that kind of simple cooperation between church and state that was very deep while respecting the competencies of those areas. And a lot of traditionalists today still like that model. And it's one of their chief criticisms of Vatican II where Vatican II in its document on religious freedom says mm -hmm. religious freedom mm -hmm. is a fundamental human right, right. and therefore this, the, 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 the church should not be in the business of coercion in religious matters and, and sort of really soft peddled even the soft integralism. And this is where the traditionalists go go crazy with Vatican II. Yeah, I know even uh, Bishop Athanasius Schneider has criticized that line of... Oh, yeah. Unlike Vigano, who just wants to get rid of all of Vatican II, right. Athanasius right. Schneider, I think, wants the next pope to sort of do a line item veto. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, he's just, much more moderated on it. I mean, yeah, said, yeah. Yeah, and his, I think his position is actually reasonable, which is, as I understand it, I don't want to mischaracterize, but as I understand it, it's that you know there are some, some errors of phrase in the documents of the Second Vatican Council, but those er errors of phrase are not contained in anything like a solemn pronunciation, so they actually can be revised by, you know, a magisterial authority. Well, and actually um, they were. That's the problem that I have with Athanasius Schneider. Uh, both, both Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict, in their encyclicals, corrected what, what were some deficiencies in Vatican II's ambiguity. So, for example, where Vatican II, call, and I'll get back to the integralism in a sec, sure, where yeah. Vatican II says that religious freedom is a right rooted in uh, human nature, the traditionalists go nuts and say, you, you have first have a moral obligation to seek the truth of God, and so does government, and so right. government has an obligation to the true faith, and error has no rights, and so this. And so they criticize Vatican II as promoting religious indifference and religious relativism. Well, John Paul and Benedict in their encyclicals, while not agreeing with the traditionalists, freely acknowledge that is one possible misunderstanding of religious freedom, and mm. they corrected it. And yeah. it, they, they, no, Christ is necessary for salvation. The church is the path to salvation because it is the church of Christ. There are ways to salvation outside of the church visibly, but it, in some mysterious way is still through, through the, the church, church. Yeah, yeah. and her sacraments and so on. Right. And so we're not arguing for religious indifference. So John Paul and Benedict mm -hmm. have already, in a sense, offered the corrective. But we are now in an era of the church where they, those two popes are being ignored. They're being eclipsed. It's like their papacies never existed. It's like mm -hmm. John Paul never wrote 300 encyclicals, you know, or whatever, however many it was. Yeah, it's yeah. like, well, that's off the radar. And neither the traditionalists nor the liberals are reading John Paul anymore, which is a great shame. It is, for sure. He yeah. offered the proper hermeneutic to the council. He really did. And offered proper correctives to some of those ambiguities that Athanasia Schneider says we need to correct. Well, they have been, mm -hmm. which makes me wonder... Well, what is it that he really thinks needs to be corrected? Because John Paul, while correcting the religious freedom thing in, in, in the direction of saying, no, it doesn't mean religious relativism, did not endorse soft integralism either. And that is what I think Schneider wants us to go back yeah. to. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and, and so that's the cor he, his corrective need, wants to go further than John Paul. So that then brings me to what I think is unique in my position, maybe not just to me, but to me sure. and people who think like me. I don't want to sound arrogant. Oh, I have, you know, this unique <laughs> position. A totally unique insight, yeah. Yeah. Nobody ever has a totally unique exactly, insight. Exactly, exactly. Nobody. But anyway, it, it, it's that even the soft integralism uh, is deeply flawed. Uh, because what it ends up doing is creating a, vi and by soft integralism, I mean this close cooperation between the Catholic Church and, and the local government, uh, and especially in countries where the Catholic faith is clearly the majority faith. All right. And so, hey, we're the majority, so we get to really kind of call the shots here. I think there's a grave problem even in that. And the grave problem is this. 
that when this happens, number one, the faith is almost always reduced to a social prop for the cultural status quo. It, it becomes simply part of the cultural wallpaper. Now, in some sense, the church should be sort of in the warp and woof of culture. Sure, yeah. It should. But we don't want the cultural tail wagging the ecclesiastical dog. Right. Yeah, definitely. And that is, you know, so you see, for example, in Poland, even though there wasn't a soft interglism, the government was communist, there was a strong integralism of church and culture, but it was the culture that was wagging the church. In other words, the culture was using Catholicism as a political tool. As to, a cudgel. To, as a cudgel, a source of unity, solidarity, right. <clears throat> to get back at the communists. John Paul was worried about this. As soon as communism fell, he starts writing about the dangers of Western consumerism in Polish society. But that's exactly then what you see. The bottom falls out, and now Poland is rapidly secularizing, and it will be, over the next 20 or 30 years, probably a formerly Catholic country like Ireland. So my point is that this is where soft integralism usually leads. It usually leads to the reduction of the church to culture, but also, very important here, it, it also tends to cause the church to begin to import models of power and models of leadership and models of government governance from the secular world, from the worldly powers which it seeks to emulate, uh, and import them into her own bureaucracy, which then becomes really deadly. You see this, for example, let me use the example of the papal states. A, sure, lot of, yeah. a lot of your uh, listeners may not be aware, because they might be young, that there, there was a time before Italy became the nation of Italy where the Pope and the papacy kind of owned about one-third yeah. of central Italy. Yeah, it's and, amazing. Yeah, and that's why there's like nine million churches in Rome and its environs <laughs> because the Vatican engaged in like this tremendous public works program to give people employment. So what are we going to We're going to build churches. <laughs> <laughs> and they're great churches, but they're all yeah. in that same sort of Baroque style. Why is that? Well, it's because that's when they were all built. That's when the papal states were at their heyday. Now, what was the just? My point is, what was the justification for the papal states? The popes argued that the papacy needs to be independent of secular powers. Right. It needs to have a buffer so that you know popes can never again be kidnapped by the French. Right. You know, as happened or whatever. And yeah, okay. That's I mean, it's really the same animating idea behind Vatican City existing yeah, now. It's just that exactly. Vatican City doesn't, doesn't have the need for the geographic buffer from France, for, right? From Exactly. We don't have to worry about France anymore. We just have to worry about Mussolini. Well, we don't have to worry about Mussolini anymore. So we'll just right. we'll confine ourselves to this little postage stamp thing. I have no problem with Vatican City State and the Vatican considered being a. a well, especially because state. Vatican City is not, it's clearly not about uh, the Pope making a land grab. I mean, it's, it's, exactly. it's, it's basically coterminous with uh, the space needed for. The, the Vatican, the central uh, administrative church, apparatus Peter's of the, administ the church, exactly. yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. To house the museums, to house St. Peter's, to do the right. audiences, to do everything a pope needs to do. So he's got right. Vatican City State, but the papal states were there, and my point is this: so the papal states were run, just like a modern nation state. They they were run without any evangelical simplicity, poverty, chastity, obedience. They were run without any sense of the gospel, really. Let's build church. You know if there were taxes in There were the taxes, yeah. and there were prisons, and wow. there were executions. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I mean, the entire apparatus of a state. So, in other words, the argument was, we need to emulate worldly power in order not to succumb to worldly power. Ignoring that, the that worked out well. Yeah, yeah <laughs> ignoring the fact that as soon as you start emulating worldly power in order not to succumb to it, you you're becoming do. what you hate. You're yeah. becoming what you hate. Yeah, precisely. You're, you're adopting those tools. And that's, I think, my main thing with regard to the Constantinian arrangement. And so forget the papal states and forget Poland and forget Ireland. Let's, let's segue to the United States, where I think, uh, this is my own private opinion, I, I am a follower of Dorothy Day and so on, but uh, I think to a great extent, even though there is a separation of church and state in this country, and for many, many, many decades, if not centuries, Catholicism was sort of on the outside looking into our culture. But since World War II, and America and, and Catholics have mainstreamed into the culture, I think what you have seen is a kind of Constantinian arrangement between the Catholic Church and American culture, 
where there are just these sort in order for us to still uh, bishops to be invited to the right cocktail parties mm -hmm. and to get the right money from the right donors to do things like rebuild St. Peter uh, St. Uh, Patrick's and so on. You you can't rock the boat too much. And so it's a soft soft integralism of of, of church and state where the church agrees well we'll 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 be on the peripheries over here and we're going to throw little Molotov cocktails at you with regard to abortion and things like that. Uh, but when it comes to a serious critique of American culture, her militarism, her, her military industrial complex, her consumerism, her rapacious capitalism, the manner in which she has essentially economically colonized huge parts of the world, creating sweatshops and so on in, in, in place. It, you know, it, it, Amer most Americans are simply not aware of the, yeah. of the economic degradations that this nation has visited upon. Uh, yeah, we've also brought good things to those cultures. I, I don't want to sound like that's not true. But my point is that where is the Catholic Church in the United States been for the past 50 or 60 years with regard to some of the great sins of the American Republic? They have been silent. Mm -hmm. They have been silent, or, or you know, if not silent, they've been functionally silent, right? Like the USCCB might put out a, yeah. a, a, a statement that's super weak and watered down and means nothing, and nobody reads and nobody really cares. So, for example, in the early '80s, yeah, the bishops of the United States put together a pastoral letter on nuclear deterrence. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I've read it. Yeah. I, I can't remember the name of it now, I, which is shameful because I wrote my master's thesis uh, <laughs> on it. Here, I'll look it up while you're talking. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I. Um, I can't think of it now, but uh, my master, I, I studied under the, the late great moral theologian, Germaine Grise, and Germaine Grise's thesis was that the American nuclear deterrent was mortally sinful, gravely immoral, because it involved the will to use weapons of mass destruction against civilian populations indiscriminately. And he said that even as a deterrent, uh, in order for the deterrent to be real and not fake, the intent has to be there to use these darn weapons, which would clearly be immoral. And so Grise's point was no Catholic can participate in that. Now, out comes this pastoral letter in the early 80s from the bishops. And, and by they the way, it's called The Challenge of Peace, God's Promise and Our it, Response. There you go. Yeah. It's a sign of my senility. I can't remember the main document of master's thesis, which was 1986 in my defense. Yeah, well, there you go. I am and, and you followed it up with a PhD, and that, that was the important one. Yeah, so. on Balthazar. So anyway, my, my, my point is that you read that challenge of peace, and it, it says all the right gobbledygook, you know, right. peace and peacemakers and blessed are the meek and yeah. blah, blah, blah. But when, when the rubber meets the road, they don't condemn anything. Yeah. It's just a lot of bromides about, oh, it's nice to be nice to the nice, and so we should really work at peace in the world. Well, duh. Why, we didn't need a document from the American bishops to say that. What we needed the American bishops to say is that no Catholic can directly participate yeah. in that system. Now, that is my private moral theological point of view shared by Germaine Grise and, and a few others. Uh, but I, I almost think it's an inescape. But this is what I'm talking about. We, we tend to focus on abortion for obvious reasons. I despise and loathe and hate abortion as much as the next person and believe it should be illegal, believe there should be a human life amendment to the Constitution. But one of the problems with the abortion battle is that it really has sucked all the air out of the room for just about anything else. And, uh, and I think that's, that's a shame. It's like we can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Like we can't condemn abortion and American militarism at the same time. And by the way, those two things I think are related. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, there's no, no doubt. Uh, you know, the very consumeristic culture of choice and choosing that is central to the capitalist enterprise, the very deeply flawed anthropology at the heart of, of, the, of the metaphysics of the American founding, I think, have unfolded into the sort of libertine notion of freedom that we have today, both in our economics, uh, but then with regard to our sexuality as well. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm digressing a little bit from the Constantinianism, but I think, in other words, my, my point in my blog is to point out there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's more than one way to be involved in a too close relationship between church and state, and that's really all I mean by Constantinian arrangements. I mean, too 
cozy a relationship between the church and power. The yeah, church, I mean, I, I think church and wealth. Right. When, when I read your blog and when I've thought about the Constantinian arrangement, you know, there, there's a reason that Jesus says, "Render unto God what is God's, and unto what unto Caesar what is Caesar's." Yes. Um, and I, I think you're right about you know this. If if we're talking about a connection between church and state, that connection can go one of two ways. You can have the uh, the state drive too much of the church, or you can have the church drive too much of the state. Exactly. Um, and, and I think uh, oftentimes, you know, in history, we look at the latter case. We look at the church driving too much of the state. Um, the papal states, I think, might be an example of that. Uh, the What you were mentioning over the past 50 to 60 years is probably an example of the opposite, where it's the, I think you said, the the state wagging the dog of the, or wagging the tail of the ecclesiastical dog, right? Yeah, right, right. And, and so and so there's this, you're right, there, there's this, um, this, uh, uh, over th- this this um, high level of comfort, um, too high a level of comfort between church and state. And you have bishops who are you know, acting as functionaries and attending all the state banquets and everything, and they rub shoulders with all the senators and congressmen and governors, um, and that's a problem. Uh, be- because it, it's a problem for a number of reasons. One of them is that I, I think it, it can corrupt the clerical class. But another problem is that it then compromises the clerical class's credibility in correcting and rebuking the public servants, right? Because because yeah. they, they need to be independent so that when they publish something and say, we oppose the use of nuclear weapons, full stop, no Catholic can do this, then they have credibility because they haven't been uh, rubbing shoulders with all the politicians who have been crafting these these you know, pro-nuclear policies, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so that's a huge problem. But I, I also think, you know, um, Tan Books, right, a, a publisher of a lot of traditional Catholic um, stuff. They have a lot of good books. I've read a lot of tan books. A lot of good um, books. They do, but they also have a few. If I'm not mistaken, I think they have a few. I think they published the Catholic case for Trump um, this past year. Oh, they've got some clunkers. Um, yeah, exactly. And and but they just released a homeschool curriculum, and, and my wife and I homeschool our kids. So I was curious about this because Tan publishes a lot of good stuff, and I was watching the intro video. And you know, not 60 seconds into the intro video, the head of their their Tan Academy, which is their curriculum. Was is uh, you know I'm looking at like a picture of a you know a montage of an American flag in the Capitol building and he's like ours is no longer a Christian nation you know and basically the gist is like we've got to get back to the Judeo Christian principles we've got to restore America to the shining city on the hill that it was and uh, every time I hear that stuff I'm just like no no uh, no you've got the wrong I, I, do, I do not want my kids growing up as little like pledge of allegiance <laughs> uh, you know proud young Americans I want them growing up as faithful Catholics yeah. and if if their country is not going to be amenable to them being a faithful Catholic, I don't want them to prioritize allegiance to country over allegiance to God. Um, and, and so I, I'm just yeah. disappointed by that too, because there is this, and, and I think we've talked about this a little bit, right? But the, the past several years, I think have revealed that there's this uncomfortable nexus, even among traditionalist Catholics. And maybe it is because of the integralism that you talked about uh, of sort of wanting to return to a, a too cozy state of affairs between church and state. Yeah, they do. Um, I think most traditionalists I know are intelligent enough to know that none of that's going to happen anytime soon. Sure. They're yeah, talk- I mean, we're certainly heading in the wrong direction. Yeah, and they're, they're talking more in theory than in practice. But this is one of the problems that I have with them. Why? I mean, I, I, I'm not an ideologue. I'm not necessarily doctrinaire about this. I mean, never in the political domain, prudence reigns supreme. There may yeah. come a day when maybe the church ought to get a little cozy with a particular government here and there in the short term for the sake of some prudential goal that the church wants to achieve. Uh, say, after World War II, if the church and the state decided to cooperate a little bit in Germany to help restructure the devastation of German society, I could see a case being made for on a temporary basis, something like that happening. But what I have a problem with the traditionalists is they are doctrinaire about this. We need, we need to maintain this in theory. And the fact of the matter is, is it's just, it, it's bad pastoral advice. What people need today is pastoral advice given more by people like Rod Dreher than the traditionalists. Pastoral advice that is going to teach us how do we live in a hostile environment. Our mm-hmm. government is hostile towards our faith. Our culture is hostile towards our faith. So the whole gist of my blog post is, why are we being cozy with a culture and a government that is hostile to us? Yeah. We need, a, and one of my critiques of Gaudium et Spes is, it was a little too naive about the hostility towards us that is out there. Uh, so we need to have a greater sense of evangelical response, which rooted in the cross, by the way, 
rooted in the path of crucifixion, rooted in the path of martyrdom, which is more than likely going to be the state and fate of the modern church. Uh, rather than it, talking and arguing about integralism is just a, a silly waste of time yeah. in a lot of ways. Yeah. Who's inter- I mean, Where? it's become a it's become a theoretical discussion at this oh, point. That's right? all it is, and what it is, yeah. it's a it's a battering ram against Vatican II. It's a battering of ram saying Vatican II taught religious relativism, and so we need to reestablish. You know, error has no rights. The yeah. vegano says we need to bring back the index of forbidden books. Oh, for crying right. out loud! Good lord. So this is this well, is well. A- Amazon's bringing its own index of forbidden books, which well, basically yeah. about how hostile you know, the culture is to what we believe. You know, and uh, yeah, we need to be uh, more aware of the deep flaws of the culture that is. Around. I mean, I was a teacher of theology for twenty years, mm-hmm. and almost almost every student. This is the value of, of homeschooling, by the way. But almost every student I taught in my theology classes had a certain script in their mind, a certain narrative, a certain script in their mind about what reality is, about what culture is, about what government is, about what religion is. And it is a script that they got straight from America, straight from American culture and, and, and so on. So both myself and my colleague Rodney Hauser, who you know, was also a very effective teacher, they realized that our number one job as teachers is we had to flip the script. Mm -hmm. You have to first begin by disabusing the students of all of these crazy, wacky ideas that they have in their heads before you can build anything constructive on that. So this this is my point with regard to the broader pastoral strategy of the modern church. We can't be talking about integralism. What nonsense. We need to be talking about flipping the cultural script. And you can only flip the cultural script if you understand the cultural script from within. You understand it deeply. And you understand what the alternative is that Christianity is offering. You cannot flip a script unless you have another. Otherwise, you end up with the situation of Christ casting out one demon and seven more return. You better have a better script in view. Well, this, of course, goes back to the, the church reading the signs of the times as well, right? You can't, well, exactly. you can't talk about changing, flipping the script unless you understand the cultural script that you're reading off of right now. And to go back to my earlier point about the Vatican, the Second Vatican Council's universal call to holiness, that's what you yes. arrive at in your blog, right? Yes. Um, and I want to talk about this a little bit more as well. You talked about the church's two dimensions. The first is the Petrin dimension, uh, Peter, of course, being the first pope, yes. the head of the apostles. And the Petrin dimension is the dimension of the church that is um, that is responsible for governance of the church. It's sort of the the, um, the outward form, the rules, the authority, structure, et cetera, of the church. Right. The Marian dimension is the receptive part of the church, is the contemplative part of the church. I mean, um, there's a there's a wonderful book by Carol Hauslander called The Read of God, and others have oh, I love said, that book. Yeah, others have said this as well, right? I mean, Mary is the um, is the prototype of the contemplative life of of religious monks and sisters throughout the world because her vocation is a contemplative one, right? She hardly says any words in scripture at all. Um, hers is largely a hidden life. Um, and, and the Marian dimension of the church is that way. Uh, and I think, well, one of the things you say in your blog post, and I totally agree with it, is that we have overemphasized, the church has overemphasized the Petra dimension, has been, has been overly yeah. concerned with authority and power and structure um, at the expense of the Marian dimension. When the Marian dimension is... Uh, is just as important, if not more so, because it requires us to be receptive to the work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Yeah, there's a reason why Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, is the patron saint of missionaries. Yeah. <laughs> Even though she was this little cloistered nun who died when she was, what, 23? Yeah, what? 23, yeah. I mean, just, yeah, yeah such, a know, beautiful, such a beautiful you know, story. And, I, and wrote her little way of humility right. and simple yeah. things. And what it points out, you know, I got that distinction between the Petrine and the Marian dimensions of the church from the Swiss theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar. Uh, he makes a huge deal. I had an article in the journal Communio about it in 1996, uh, talking about the Marian subjectivity of the church. Balthasar is very clear. The Petrine dimension, though absolutely critical and necessary for the sacramental, objective structure and teaching of the church, is just there as a skeletal structure to give to give a foundation for the living organs of the body. Right. And those living organs are completely animated. 
suffused with the life-giving blood of contemplative prayer, with that Marian openness, fiat, and humility. And this, to me, is the beginning point of what I mean by the universal call to holiness. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean we all have to be Dorothy Day out there in soup kitchens. Uh, that's almost impossible for one. You know, one of my blog posts was called Five Kids in a Golden Doodle. <laughs> and it was inspired by uh, a former student of mine who lives in Florida with his wife, and she's also a former student, and they have five kids and a golden doodle. And I sent him this article on Dorothy Day that I had written, and he goes, Ugh, he writes back to me, Ugh, how am I supposed to live this life when I have five yeah. kids and a golden doodle? And that right. really hit me. You know, it's easy for me in my old age and empty nester and all that to start, ah, we need a universal call to holiness where everybody runs to the soup kitchens. Well, that's not true. Yeah. <clears throat> Most people are going to find their holiness in the quiet uh, crucifixion of being a parent. Yeah. Uh, and I don't mean that necessarily insouciantly or superficially. Uh, for example, you know, I had, a, I had a sister who died at age five of a, a heart defect that she was born with. And I remember, you know, my parents had five kids and this was in the late 60s, early 70s that she was ill. And I remember my mom being up all night with my yeah. sister and, you know, I mean, any, Anybody out there listening who's a parent with a, with just with any kids, but with a severely handicapped or ill child, knows therein is your path to holiness. It is a silent, quiet crucifixion that does not get noticed enough by our church, by our society. The everyday sacrifices that that parents make for their children. And well, I, I haven't I haven't shared this story um, on the podcast, but. When, uh, when one of my sons was born, he was born, he had a hard delivery and was born with two collapsed lungs. So it's called a pneumo, pneumothorax, you have an air yeah, cavity. Yeah. You know, um, and in his case, it was an air cavity on both sides. And it was a scary delivery, obviously, because it was a hard delivery in the first place. Um, and then when he was born, you know, the NICU team had to whisk him away to the NICU. And uh, it was beautiful, though, because I mean, he's, he's fine now, he's doing great. Oh, um, thank God, yeah. Uh, yeah, but... but um, you know, uh, my, my wife's sister texted her because my wife was obviously, my wife and I were both pretty emotional about this because we weren't sure what was going to happen to our son. It was right. a really tough moment. And uh, my wife's sister texted her and said, um, you know, I, I, as you're dealing with this right now and you saw your, your son um, struggling in pain and discomfort, obviously cl clearly trying to breathe and not doing it very well, she thought of Mary at the foot of the cross looking up at Jesus. And oh, there's yeah. Mary going back to the Marian dimension of the church. There's Mary looking up at her son who is suffering and in agony. And I mean, in a very real way, trying to breathe and not being able to on the cross. Um, and so that was a beautiful thing to realize as well. And ours obviously is a very, very, very small trial in comparison. And like I said, he's fine now. And we're thankful to God for that. But you're right that that is such a, such a cross for any parent. And no matter what the struggle, I mean, I mean, every, every parent has our crosses to bear. And my wife and I talk about this all the time. We had another friend over recently who was talking about just being a mom and she said you know it really is a hidden life and i thought again of the marian dimension of the right. church i mean it's being a parent especially a mom who's who's not working outside of the home being a stay-at-home mom is really a hidden life because you work so hard i mean just just uh, last week i had an episode um with lee labresco sergeant and serena Siglito, and they were talking about you know moving towards a new feminism that recognizes the value and dignity of women's work in the home because women Amen. in the home stay at homes mom stay at home moms work harder than almost any of us uh, who are out there yeah, you know, having, a, it, having it, a quote unquote career. Um, and, and it really is a cross despite it being such a hidden life. And, and so much, and th that's true. And uh, despite the fact that it might seem sexist to talk about stay at home moms, the fact is that most stay at home parents are mothers still mm -hmm. to this day. Right. And I think they're at the risk of being condemned by certain people. I think there must be something rooted in, <laughs> Human nature. <laughs> Hold on, you're going to get your uh, your book banned by Amazon. Though, right? Yeah, you know, <laughs> with regard to this, I mean, obviously, it's not a hard and fast rule. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, I pretty much raised my daughter, but anyway, um, so you know, it's not a big deal. But I, I would say, this this is key. It, the the silence of holiness is the key of why contemplative prayer is so powerful. As Jesus says, you know, when you give alms, don't let people see you. Go in your closet and pray. And that that's because it's then it's not for show. It's not pretension. Right. It's it not is, performative. It yeah. is not, yeah, it's not a performance. And I think so much of family life, not just parenting, but even be, I, I, I go to, I have to admit, I go to the Antichrist for my grocery shopping. I go to Walmart 
uh, oh boy. for grocery oh boy. shopping because it's uh, it's the store near me and it's inexpensive. Right. But there is one cashier there, an old lady, who's there every time I'm there, and I always choose to go through her line. We've gotten to know each other. And she is always so happy and so chipper and so friendly and gets to know people by their names and so on. So one day I asked her, I said, Ruth, that's her name, Ruth, why, why you come in here every day and I have to tell you that it's such a joy Oh. Especially in the era of COVID and masks, and right, so right. to come in here and see such, a, I said, "How do you, how do you, you must have bad days, Ruth. Why don't you ever have a bad day?" And she goes, well, "I'm going to tell you something. I'm 85. My husband is 83. Wow. She's actually older than her husband. My husband has Alzheimer's, and it's very advanced. And I'm home most of the time, taking care of him. And so I have just resolved that when I am here." I am going to bring joy into people's lives because you never know oh what they are secretly going through at home. Wow, that's cool. And that is, I said, that, that is so true. The silent crucifixion that so many people in the quiet of their homes go through, uh, that, is the, that is the normal path to holiness mm -hmm. uh, for most people. And I think sometimes we, we envision... Uh, the, the problem that Vatican II was trying to get around to return to that is a notion of holiness that is simply rooted in monastic religious orders. Right, right. Uh, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Now, all lay people are even are called to live the evangelical councils in their particular state in life, but but in their modality. But what the council wanted to do is we have to we have to find a way to passionately translate the path to holiness to the laity as well. Right. Uh, the, in other words, we, we don't have this two-tiered system in the church. The holy people are up here. They're all in convents and monasteries <laughs> right, right. Yeah, and rectories. Well, we know yeah. that's not true. And, uh, and then the, the rest of the laity are all down here, and they're simply following the path of the commandments rather than the councils. And theirs is a less, well, you know, it is technically a, a less perfect state in life. Right, right. All right, and I would agree with that. Technically, theologically, but in lived existence, I would say lay people by and large are holier than most clerics I know. Uh, now, I say that advisedly because I know a lot of holy clerics, and I know a sure. lot of unholy lay people. I'm also, and this could be a different conversation for a different day, I'm also of the opinion that lay people get the clergy that they deserve. Uh, because lay people create the culture out of which the clergy emerge. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, that's... Well, and I mean, to, in a very concrete example, it's lay moms and dads who raise yeah. the boys who become clergy, right? Yeah. So Or don't become clergy, as the yeah. case may yeah. be, as we right. see the bottom falling out of the vocations uh, in the United States because parents are no longer emphasizing, emphasizing. that. Yeah. There's no yeah. longer this vibrant faith life at home. I saw a statistic the other day that said, uh, how many vocations are coming out of the homeschool? The Catholic right. homeschool movement. Well, wow, yeah. that's because those are homes with an ambient faith. Right. There's at least one in our diocese that I know of. Yeah. Yeah. So. No, that's that's uh, that's so true. Um, yeah, and I think I think every this this is the spiritual genius of Saint Jose Maria Escriva. I'm not in Opus Dei, but I have several friends who are. Um, one of my best friends is a supernumerary, and this is one of the things that he's helped me understand that that everyone is called to holiness. And and you know, I think it was Saint Jose Maria who pointed out in a very pithy quote that the, the greatest, the greatest male saint of all time was not a bishop or a priest or a pope, but a lay woodworker. His name was St. Joseph. St. Joseph. And, yes. and, and he was a father, right? And so, um, so yeah. this is a path to holiness and can be a path to great holiness if we accept the cross uh, with willingness. And then I that think your point be too about for our sakes. Right. Right. <laughs> I think, uh, I know, I hope so. Uh, I mean, but it is hard. I mean, um, my wife and I just talk all, all the time about how hard it is to be a parent because your time is not your own. Um, you know, especially for a woman, her body is not her own, right? Because, uh, because labor is uh, um, just carrying a child to term and labor is really hard on the body. Uh, sure and there's is. a long recovery after that. Um, your sleep is not your own. Right. Uh, and, and so it's, 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 a, it's very challenging. And then uh, that's without even taking into account all the worry that you have about your kids and the, the health problems that, that can arise and the struggles with all those. And, you know, there's a, um, there's a woman in our parish who we absolutely adore whose, whose children have some serious health conditions and, and the holiness that she has, I'm guessing as a result of that is just, it's, it's self-evident and it's a beautiful thing to see. I mean, for her motherhood has truly been a path to holiness. Um, and that's really good. 
And that's so, because, yeah, we're not masochists in saying that suffering, the way of the cross, is the path to holy. That's not masochism. Right. But what suffering does is it focuses, it focuses your mind, your soul, your heart, everything about you on what's most important. As everything else falls away in the midst of the, the and so much of our suffering is caused by what we have to sacrifice for the sake of others. The cross is an action for others. Christ died for us. And thus, as we emulate the cross, our whole lives must be characterized as the path of for others. And that then is the essence of holiness, to live a life completely transparent to the needs of other people. That is impossible. <laughs> it's yeah. so hard yeah. to do. I'm one selfish guy. That is like the ultimate challenge to me. So. Yeah, me too, for sure. Yeah, I'm. Yeah, it's selfish. the conceit of the intellectual, right? I live in my head. Yeah, yeah. I live in my head. No, I mean, know? concrete example. Uh, just last night, you know, my my wife was out at Eucharistic Adoration actually, and uh, the kids were home with me and. They were in bed, but, you know, our girls were sort of in and out of bed. They needed various things from me. Our youngest son wasn't wanting to go to sleep, so I had to spend a lot of time putting his pacifier back in his mouth. And um, You know, my wife came home, and admittedly, I was grumpy, and I was just, like, not in a great mood because I wanted to get a bunch of reading done while she was gone, and I didn't get the chance to because I was attending to my kids the whole time. And, you know, so basically, the, the, the moral of the story, I apologize, but I, I ultimately went to bed still kind of feeling grumpy, you know, and I woke up um, the next morning and was just thinking, that was super selfish of me. I, like, I need to be embracing this cross because this is the lot that's marked out for me. And uh, just as scripture says, the lot marked out for me is my delight. You know, I think I often as a father oh, yeah. need to recognize that as well and remember that, right? This is the lot that God has marked out for me. I just need to embrace this um, and pursue the universal call of holiness, whatever my station is. And in this oh, case, my station amen. is to be to be a dad of, of young kids. So Live in the place where you stand. And yeah. uh, isn't that a song by somebody? Probably. I'm, I'm not really a good pop culture song reference guy, so I'm probably the wrong person to ask. But it sounds like it could be, so you'd, you'd have yeah. me believe it. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> was there anything else we wanted to go through here? I think. Well, we I do want to. I do want to read. Um, you've got away with words, Larry. I want to read an excerpt from your article here, and kind of just end on this. So, you know, sure. we're talking about the solution out of these problems. The solution is holiness. How that holiness comes about is going to look different for every person because of our stations in life, et cetera. But I, I like how you situate in your blog post, you situate that call to holiness, that pursuit of holiness to which every lay and religious person is called against the sort of debates that when juxtaposed against that seem rather trivial. So uh, you have this paragraph that goes like this. The pathology is, unfortunately, as deep as can be seen in the quality of our current debates. Is Pope Francis a heretic? Should we take communion on the hand or on the tongue? Is the Novus Ordo a creation of Freemason conspirators? Should women lecture at Mass? Is Vatican II a robber council? Should Benedict still be wearing a white cassock? Latin or vernacular, Gothic or fiddleback? Should homosexuals be ministered to gently, or should we smash them over the head with a catechism as we refuse to bake them cakes? Is Vigano a prophet or a clown? Should the Vatican Bank be shut down? How should the Curia be reformed? Should some women be made cardinals, deacons? Is Bishop Barron a dangerous modernist? Was, ba was Von Balthasar a heretic? All of these debates signal a church still locked in the heathenism of power insofar as they are all concerned with winning the debate for their side of disputes that are essentially concerned with the petron element of the church at the expense of the Marian. Where are the debates over asceticism, prayer, penance, vocational commitment, evangelization, and so on? Off the radar, nobody cares. My good friend Father Michael Kerper calls this sort of thing team theology. And lost in the debates as we take our side with our team members is the one thing necessary, Luke 10.42. In short, we are a church of Martha's. Now, every year, Larry, my family and I select saints. We, um, we draw, we, we, we write a huge list of saints, one, one, or a list of men saints and a list of women saints. Um, and then we rip them up and we put them into a hat and we, we, we say a prayer and then we draw them out of the hat and we choose our family saints for the year that way. And this year we, um, we have St. Martha and St. Francis of Sales. So St. Martha is a great saint to emulate. And I was thinking about that when I was reading that because going back to this, this story in Luke chapter 10, where Martha's just worrying about doing the housekeeping and making sure everything is good to go and perfectly in order for Jesus and his guests. Mary is just sitting there. Uh, Mary, the sister of Martha, not the mother of Jesus. Mary is sitting there just listening to Jesus, just hanging on every word and, and trying to become holy. You know, how, can I, right. how can I cling closer right. to my Lord? And uh, then Martha complains, right, about that how Mary's not helping with... Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Jesus, she's not helping me with the dishes. Tell her to help me with the dishes. Um, I wonder and, if she said it that politely too. Yeah, I mean, probably not, right? <laughs> probably not. And then Jesus says, uh, you know, Martha, you're concerned about many things. Mary is concerned about only one thing. And the one thing that we need to be concerned about is holiness, right? I mean, which is not to say, and you say this in the piece too, not to say that those questions don't need to be answered. They do. 
right? But they do, of course. Um, and there is such a thing as doctrinal rectitude, and we do need to be we do need to be concerned about doctrinal rectitude, but we can only do that correctly. That will only be an aid to our holiness if we are first concerned with our holiness, if we're first con- concerned with pursuing the person of Jesus Christ. So um, oh, yeah. that's, I think, one of the ways in which, uh, one of the things we need to take away from this. Yeah, the one line in there that you just read that got brought me the most flack from some of my friends was the thing in there about homosexuals. Mm-hmm. People sort of launched into it. But, but and I, I probably should have made it clear, of course I support the church's teaching in, in yeah. these matters. My point is you're not going to, you're not going to make any headway, even in those kinds of moral debates, unless your focus is on Christ, as you just said. Unless right. the, the focus is squarely on how do I live a life of holiness? How do I live a life of Christ? As long as the questions say of how do we deal with uh, minister to homosexuals is simply part of this whole ideological package of all these sorts of petrine questions, we're not, I don't think, this could just be me, we're just not going to make a lot of headway. Yeah. No, I think that's right. I mean, I certainly didn't have issue with that line because I know where you're coming from. I knew what you were saying in that yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that you're not, uh, you're not pulling a, um, you know, James Martin and sort of <laughs> no, quietly not, subverting not the church's all. teaching. I, yeah. I thoroughly support the, te- the <laughs> church's teaching. In, no, in, I, I know, in, I know you do. I mean, I, I think sexuality. Yeah. I took it as sort of a tongue-in-cheek comment, right? That um, oh, yeah. in, in some ways it's a false dichotomy, right? Like the the two options are gently minister, you know, a la James Martin, or bash over the or head Mike Voris or Mike Voris. <laughs> yeah, right. What he calls right, exactly. the, you know, the homo heresy in the church and the sodomites. Well, you're right. not going to win over a lot of the yeah. sodomites if you're calling them sodomites all the right. time, Voris. Yeah, 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 exactly. You know, and and that's the point. So really, it was a kind of veiled smack at these right-wing culture warriors totally, yeah. on, on the on the issue that are completely counterproductive, in my yeah. opinion, in how they approach no, this. No, I totally concur. Um, but I appreciate the blog post. Um, we'll, we'll choose another topic to discuss next time. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think, you know, the takeaway, again, uh, pursue holiness. That's what each of us are called to. The other questions uh, are important, and they can be dealt with in their time, but we need to be concerned not about the, the many things of Martha, but about the one thing of Mary, we need to be concerned about um, hanging on to Jesus as close as we possibly can. Um, so that is that for this conversation. Um, Larry, thanks so much for joining me. Hey, for thank you. This is great. One. This is fun. I'm looking forward to more. Uh, and to my listeners, if you want to reach out, you can reach out to me. I'm happy to pass stuff to Larry as well. But Zach, Z-A-C, at credocatholic.com. And until next time, God bless you.